Hello, this is Don Victor, author of Drawn to Win, host of the podcast Drawn to Win, the director of the Academy of Composition, and the creator of the Core 80 Experience, also known as the C and Grow Rich in Art video course, which you can find out more information at core80.com. This is the Drawn to Win podcast, where I have the incredible privilege to draw artists from around the world into fun and meaningful conversations around art and life, and yes, maybe even a little food. You can hear us each week on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and YouTube. So make sure you subscribe so you always have a seat among friends. Let's get into the show. Matthew, what are you currently working on in your studio? Um, I am working on a self-portrait, which... I haven't done in a long time. Wow. That's always the, the piece to work on that. uh, I hear so many artists say, man, this year I'm going to do a self portrait and then it never happens. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's so true. It's not something that immediately comes to my mind or that I would naturally want to paint. I don't think the last time I did one, I think was in art school. Right. uh, What's the challenge of it? She's like, you should, you should do one. Oh, okay. So you're doing it for her then. Well, I guess um, in a manner of speaking, yeah. <laughs> she's like, I'm tired of looking at the real you. Give me a, an ideal version <laughs> of you. Um, what, what what do you think is the biggest challenge? Like doing, because you do a lot of por- like figurative work and portraits mm-hmm. and things. Like what, what do you think the big challenge is uh, when doing your, your own, like doing a self-portrait? Um... Well, it's harder just looking at yourself, but I think basically it's the same as, you know, painting the face is just hard in general, no matter whose it is. Mm. Um, It might be harder doing a self-portrait because I don't look at myself all the time. Like you look at other people. So if I paint my wife, I see her all the time. So I know when I'm screwing it up. (laughs) Um, So I guess in that way, it would definitely be harder. Do you ever, when doing your self-portrait, like, I'm doing it right, but damn, that don't look like me. <laughs> no, usually I know it's that I'm doing it right because it does look like me. And okay. It's like, like yesterday, I was like, oh, I screwed the ear up. Uh, ears are hard. They are tricky. <laughs> um, so what is this, like a... a three quarters or a yeah, profile? Yeah, just like shoulders up, three quarter, you know, tilt so I can kind of get, look in the mirror, look at the painting. and Nice. I think the last self-portrait I did was probably about maybe three, I guess about three years ago. And um, it was, it was cool, man. Uh, I was, I was really overweight. <laughs> Still am, but not, not nearly as much as I was. I was like probably, 60 70 pounds more than i am today uh-huh. and uh and my wife recently left and uh and and so what i did is i i, I was like okay i gotta reset some things and um i created this manifesto for my family and i printed them out and, and it was actually what uh i trained my daughter to read on so it was the first thing she ever read was our family manifesto and my mom's like, oh, you need to write one for yourself. And so I tried for like three months. I couldn't get the words out. And then I got this crazy idea, like images speak louder than words. So what yeah. if I just drew the version of myself that I feel that, you know, I, I put it this way. When, when I pray and the guy that I see in the mirror I know like that's not what God sees. Right. And so I was wondering like, okay, if I prayed in God, like who is it that God sees? Right. Like, so that's the, that's the version of myself that I drew, which was very, very different. And then I took a picture of it and I stuck it on my cell phone. Right. Mm -hmm. And it took, and so the thought was that it was, it became like a vision board. So every time I would look at my phone, which was, you know, 493 times a day, uh, this, this guy was staring back at me. So it was like carrying around this, this 
prophetic mirror, if you will. And it was in Atlanta, Georgia, um, where I looked at the phone and I thought I saw a reflection of myself. And it was in that moment I realized that I, I really stepped into that version of myself. And it was this very strange moment. And, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, it's really cool, man. I like yeah, that a lot. It was, it was a, it was a cool little project, you know? <clears throat> yeah. Actually I'm leaving this self portrait. I, I decided I was going to leave the bottom of it unfinished. Um, you know, that whole, um, cause I'm unfinished still. Hopefully I'm, I'm same kind of thing. Hopefully I'm growing into a better, Nice, nice. I got you. What God sees, indeed, indeed. Um, there's a. Um, I actually put a, together a little, almost like a little course around it because I was like, it was weird. I went, <laughs> I went on this date years later, uh, it, with this psychologist girl, and we started talking about uh, art and things and brought up this self-portrait thing and um and then uh we kind of came up with this idea of maybe helping kids you know with like doing a self-portrait of themselves like that mm-hmm. and then giving them design tools so for example like if you are a person who might have um who who, who might be struggling with keeping calm right mm-hmm. like so you might be really like you might get angry quickly or something um if you take the eyes of in the self portrait and you make sure that when you're composing them, that you generate a lot of horizontals in those eyes, when someone looks at it because of the horizontals, it'll trigger a sense of calm and they'll say, wow, they have calm eyes. Right. Um, or if you want authority, like let's say uh, you want more strength and you want to see yourself as more of a strong person, someone with power and authority, then you may construct the, the self-portrait with a lot of verticals because verticals mm-hmm. trigger that type of sensation. And so there's different ways, like different patterns, I call them line patterns, uh, that you can embed into uh, a portrait that then radiate out a certain message. And, um, and so then obviously the idea is by looking at it, you'll begin to see yourself more as this person who is calm or more uh, powerful or, you know, someone who has greater authority. Um, and so, so it's, it's still a project that I, I'd like to see to come to fruition and, 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 uh, and become of use to other people. But uh, yeah, that's interesting. we'll see where 2018 takes us. <laughs> um, so, so you're working on self-portrait. Um, wh- when did you, like stumble upon your, as I said earlier, your superpower. <laughs> <laughs> um, not early, really early. Like yeah. I, I always knew that, you know, I was going to be an artist. I was always fascinated in it. Um, always loved drawing. And um, I like to ask people when they decided not to be artists early. Oh, that's a great question because that is a, a part of the process, isn't it? Yeah, right. You look at kids. Like I look at my kids. They they love drawing and painting and being creative, and I, every kid does. And then at some point they stop, but I never stopped. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Oh uh, yeah, I always knew, and uh, it was you know kind of a blessing and a curse. But uh, mm-hmm. so, what was the curse part of it? Um. Well, I mean. All that cliche stuff. I mean, being an artist is hard. Mm-hmm. It's hard to make a living at it. It's, it comes with a lot of rejection and disappointment and, you know, loneliness. You work alone a lot and, you know, there's, there's down times, you know, it's, you got to go through all that stuff to, to get out to the other end. Mm. When, how old were you when you really like tapped um, into it I, shoot, I don't know i mean my i have awesome parents mm-hmm. um, they always supported me and uh, i mean probably as early as as middle school you know i was mm-hmm. going uh, to art schools and art camps um 
went to Ring Ring in, in Sarasota. I would, I would go to Micah in Baltimore. And yeah, they they were super supportive. So I don't know exactly how early, but. That's awesome, man. So yeah. well, you would say between the ages of 12 and 15? Yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah. There's a recurring theme I ask people, what were you doing between the ages of 12 and 13 that you can publicly share with us, of course. Um, and, uh, and that's a lot. And, and the reason why I always say is because when you're between those ages, you're too old to be an, a, a kid, but you're too young to be an adult. Right. And you're going through all these changes. And so it's like this really amazing moment in, in, in someone's life where they begin to really discover and take hold of who they are. Then sadly, as they go into adulthood, a lot of the big challenge is the world's going to tell you not to be who you are, you know, mm-hmm. and then you're either going to comply or, or, or not. Uh, and so it's always cool talking to professional artists because they, they've gone through that process. And in the end, um, through the trials and tribulations of it, decided that uh, they weren't going to give up themselves and, and kept, kept arting through. <laughs> right. So, so, um, so you went to these camps, like, was that like a really great like pillar experience for you um well yeah i mean it's uh it just kind of encouraged encouraged you know my uh my desire and what i wanted to do and and learn more things and kind of um you know see what it's all about i guess you know the this world of making art Hmm. Uh, i didn't there aren't any artists in my family okay um so i mean i have an aunt and uncle that they were ballet dancers so they're performing that's cool (laughs) Um, but no visual artists so it wasn't like um there was a you know a known career path so to speak um so it was it was cool to to just see other artists and and start to learn the the techniques and and all that so nice yeah i'm glad my parents were so supportive what um has become as an adult what has become one of the one or two you know one or two uh influences um that that's not art per se but something in your life that that influences your work um there's lots of stuff i mean I'm a Christian. I believe in in a creator, and you know, I'm, I'm constantly seeing things in my environment that I'm I'm seeing beauty in things that I, you know, wouldn't wouldn't normally see mm. uh, that inspire me. And I think that's part of the job of the artist is to sort of elevate the uh, know, not the mundane, but there's just just beauty in so many things that a lot of people don't don't see you just walk by or take for granted. And, uh, um, so I'm, I'm constantly seeing, seeing stuff, you know, when the light changes, you know, and it's like, wow, that's right now the light is really beautiful on this, whatever the object is, or you know, mm. this room just looks so atmospheric. You need to stop and look at it and try to figure out what it is that makes it so beautiful. I don't know. Does that make sense? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I actually remember driving down, uh, uh, well, actually, in this case, it was up a road, um, and the light was hitting uh, the edge of these hills and the trees and the shadows, and then it was this little building, this little farmhouse building that was popping out, and I was like, wow, it's just so beautiful. Yeah. I was trying to figure out why it was beautiful, and the revelation that came to me as I was driving through was the fact that what makes it beautiful is the fact that there are laws that man did not create or invent, that there's something beyond us and everything that we see um, submits to this, this government, this law. Right. And, and if it does, it, it, it's like this alignment occurs that, 
we just it just produces a sense of safety and and calm and like all and and you're just like wow we're we're actually cared for we're in a nest you know <laughs> and um <clears throat> and it was it was uh, it was kind of magical yeah there's still things that like that catch people you know mm-hmm. i'll be driving home and i'll see people pulled off on the side of the road taking a picture of a sunset or something you know that's always a sunset seem to grab people mm. uh, but i mean it's just like i'm there's so many so many little things uh that especially nowadays with everybody like staring at their phone half the mm-hmm. time, not observing the their environment and the world that they're living in um yeah that's yeah so like i said i guess that's part of what i think an artist you know can can contribute um is showing people that there's beauty there in an everyday object it's awesome man that's awesome Hey, um, um, George O'Keefe, you know, she talked about that a lot, you know, people in New York walking around and, and not seeing the flower. And uh, I don't remember the exact quote, but it's something like, I'm going to paint that flower, you know, so big that they're going to see it whether they want to or not. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, that's, I like that. I, yeah, like that kind of what it, I mean, that's kind of what it is. I mean, you know, it's, it's a lot of what I do is I do still life painting and it's like, oh, you know, maybe that's boring to, to a lot of artists, but there's also beauty in it to me because, you know, just taking a piece of fruit or whatever and taking it out of its normal context and, you know, showing it in a beautiful, beautifully created way that just makes people stop and ponder it for a hot second, you know? Nice, man. Nice. I like that. Um, d- do you travel? Yeah. Yeah, travel's a big influence and uh, it really spurs my creativity. I love traveling. One of the paintings that you have, I absolutely just love. And um, Just one? F- <laughs> um and well i'm there's about three that i would probably talk about but so i'm going to talk about this one right now um and when i saw it 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 just triggered a whole bunch of memories and feelings both of my past and of my future um but looking at it i was like i don't think that's in the u.s and and so i was kind of curious uh-huh. It might be, but uh, it it was the guy sitting on in front of a big big door with his two dogs. Yeah, and I was like, "Where where is that from?" Like, it yeah, might be the U.S., uh, but like, I don't know. That's called Alone with Friends. That was <laughs> in uh, in Fabriano, Italy. Ah, nice. Okay, very very cool. Which is a really cool medieval town. Um, there's no tourists there. So it's it's a really cool place to visit. Mm. I've been there a couple of times. Oh wow! Actually, nice. it's the, it's funny because I I painted that for my first trip, and when I went back a second time, I saw the same guy with his dogs. <laughs> same in the same place. That, it wasn't the same place, but it was you know, I mean, what it's a small was town. He, I guess was he that. just like an old dude? I mean, was he like a homeless guy, or, or was he just a uh, homeless? And I, okay, and I don't know. That's part of what I I found beautiful when I just saw him sitting there. It seemed like he was either really going through something or just really thinking about something. He was in his own world, yeah. and uh, he just looked so alone. But he was obviously there with his two two dogs and uh, they his friends. But uh, <laughs> his close friend. That's awesome, man. Yeah, he he reminded me of uh, a time when I was when I was in Portugal. Um, something heartbreaking happened a few hours earlier and I just, I just was walking through the city and I just had to sit down and I was sitting on a pair of steps very much like that. Right. Exactly. And I was just lost in thought and I I actually was crying about something and I had these cool sunglasses on and I was like, it's kind of amazing sunglasses. You can walk through a crowd crying and nobody knows. Um, Very poetic, but uh, (laughs) And and then what was neat is I didn't have dogs, although there were dogs everywhere in Portugal. Um, 
but I befriended a whole bunch of pigeons and I just go every day and just like, um, sometimes I'd be dressed like, like, like a, like a bum. And sometimes I was dressed really, really sharp. And it was just kind of funny to sit there. You know, I, I just go to the bakery, buy bread. And then like, after a while, people would just give me the bread because they realized I was buying bread to give the birds. So they just like kind of put it to the side for me. Um, nice. and, and my, my dad raised birds. And so when I would start missing home, I would go feed the birds. Okay. And they would just, yeah. they would just, you know, there were a couple birds that looked like they were like, maybe, you know, had rabies or something. So I would like throw them food a little further away, you know, but uh, I'm like, uh, yeah. And there was like this little Chinese shop. Uh, it was like a little cafe and, um, and I don't know, these little Chinese girl would come out and like try to run and stomp on the birds. She'd piss me off. So when she would run, I throw the bird, the, the the bread like towards her, and then the bird would flock her. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, but yeah, okay. so that, that was that was one. I, I really enjoyed that painting. Um, and I didn't think he was homeless because those dogs look really really healthy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they're like bigger than you would. Um, but uh, yeah, that was, that's cool, man. That's cool. Thanks. So, what other places have you visited? Um, let's see, my wife and I went to Greece. Um, what really? That's awesome, man. We went to the Santorini. It's just beautiful. It's like mm. no place like that. Is that the one with the blue, the blue uh, buildings. Yeah. 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 Um, and. I guess Hawaii would be a close second. That's its own little paradise. Wow. Um, but yeah, just the U.S. I love traveling around the U.S. Um, uh, I went to I went to school in New York City. I love New York. Mm. Um, Where'd you go to school? Uh, Pride Institute. Oh, okay. Yeah. Brooklyn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was a great. That was a great experience for me. Really enjoyed that. Nice. Um, that's a. Uh, it's kind of a funny story. I don't know. You might like this. Um, I mentioned how I didn't really have a, you know, art in my in my family. So my parents didn't really know what to what to do when it. <laughs> it's like, are you getting out? You, you, end of high school's coming up. You know what what happens? Mm-hmm. Uh, so we um, we wrote to Walt Disney mm-hmm. and asked, you know, hey, where do you where do you guys recruit from? Cause this was like, um, it's mid nineties, you know, Disney was going through that whole Renaissance or that, I guess they're coming off little mermaid and lion King and beauty and the beast. So mm-hmm. it's like, and I wasn't really into animation, but I, I really liked, um, you know, concept painting and background painting and stuff like that. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, they, they sent a, a list of the schools they hire from and uh, kind of crossed off the ones on the West Coast because they didn't want to go that far and applied to all the other ones. So, and Pratt was one of them? Pratt was one of them, yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, you had a plan. That was, you... yeah, that was pre-internet, you know? It wasn't like you could Just go Google and find, it. You know, <laughs> artists that you wanted to study with or... Um, you know, ateliers in your area. I mean, there weren't really that or hardly any ateliers. I didn't even know what that was. I remember it was years after I got out of school where I started coming across, you know, ateliers. And I was like, what? What is that? And I didn't even know what, how to say it. And I was like, Aitler? What's an Aitler? <laughs> I don't know what that is, but it sounds really, really cool. <laughs> Wish I'd known about that. Um, but yeah, so that's how I, I found prep. That's awesome. In Portugal, they have ateliers, and I'm like, "Oh wow, ateliers! I'm gonna go check one out." And I go in there, and it's like a, it's like a, a little retail store or something, um, because a lot of the ateliers there are just basically what we would call an artist studio. Right. It's not a training place necessarily. Like okay. in the states, it's much more like, "Oh, it's the train," or you go to get trained, right? Right. Um, but there, it's like, "Oh, it's a artist studio," you know. So, yeah. uh, but well, um, big movement now. I mean, that's that's exploded in the last yeah. 
decade. Have you studied that one? No, no, I haven't. I'd, I'd love to um, you know, take, take things to another level, I guess. There's one, um, I talked to a lady in Australia and she went three times to this one in it's called the Florence Academy. Oh yeah. Um, Daniel Graves, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I was looking at that one. I was like, well, you know, that's actually, that, that looks really, really good. <laughs> yeah. But, um, and I guess he has um, a couple uh, studios around the world. Yeah, um, I know they opened one up. I think it's in New Jersey. Oh, not, really? Not too long ago. I oh, cool. I think so. I, I do get them mixed up, but I think that's a, a new development. But yeah, they're definitely expanding. Yeah, that, that's cool. I, I'm I, uh, happy for them. I like yeah. I like his work. Graves and, and uh, Jacob Collins and all those guys that they yeah. are the, carrying the torch. I just wish I had, you know, had the internet back then. I could have found them. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I have to take a little sabbatical. Um, and go. So, so do you paint full time, or do you have like a little, you know, little side job, this little side hustle? Yeah. Well, I paint. I. Uh, that's a long story. <laughs> um, so I worked when I when I got out of art school. Um, I was pretty disillusioned with the whole fine art world. Hmm. Um. And I had my, uh, I guess my, the courses I had, I had steered into more commercial um, illustration route. Okay. And doing children's books and stuff. Uh, but I was also in, in the summers, I was interning at a little boutique design firm. Um, and they, they hired me right out of school. So I was like, well, do I stay in New York and go hungry or... <laughs> I, I, so I, that's how I started getting into, um, you know, working as a full-time designer and and uh, working in agencies, hmm. um, which was, you know, obviously where I needed to be at that time. But it was also, you know, got to be more and more difficult on mm-hmm. me. Um, I'm sure you've probably talked about with other people, you know, it's it's hard when an artist isn't doing no, oh, I don't need to talk about it. I, I worked in that agency too. Yeah. And, and so I, yeah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, on the one hand, I was like, I was grateful to be having some sort of creative outlet and, you know, being paid really well for it. But on the other hand, you know, I was really good at it. And it's, it's just that weird thing in the corporate world where if you're good at something, they want you to do something else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was like, "Oh, you're good at this. How about you, uh, you know, start managing people and you know, climb this ladder?" And it just got to be like, you know, just like a little part of me was dying inside because I wasn't, I wasn't actually doing creative stuff as much anymore, and I certainly wasn't painting much. Uh, so you know what that's like. Yeah. So eventually, it just kind of reached that point where I just broke down, and I was like talking to my wife I'm like I can't I can't keep doing this um yeah because you're you're artistically dying yeah exactly you're you're starving not not your belly's not starving but your soul is yeah it was bad it was bad news I was not in a good not in a good place and um and even now you know my wife will be like you know, if I if I haven't been in the studio for a few days, I start getting grumpy, and she's like, "You need some, <laughs> you need some brush time." Some brush time. That's um, nice. Yeah, so it's I got to I got to do what I was born to do, I guess. But yeah. that was one of the that was definitely short list of one of the hardest things to do in my life was to walk away from that that steady paycheck. Mm-hmm. Um. And, uh, you know, just, just go out on a limb. And, you know, it, it worked out. And I still I still freelance uh, design work, and I, and I love doing that. Um, but I have so much more time now to paint. Nice. Yeah, yeah definitely, uh, definitely in a great place. <laughs> love what I'm doing. There's a, a, a book called The E-Myth, and 
<clears throat> it lays out this idea, this concept of that to make a company run, you need three types of personalities. You need this entrepreneurial salesperson and you need a manager and you need the labor. And one is not better than the other because without one, the business can't function. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, especially creatives, we're, we're a lot of times we're, we're, we're entrepreneurial in the sense that we can see solutions and see into the invisible. Um, and then we're also labor because you love the the craft, and then right. and then when you're good at that, let's say especially the labor thing, you want to come in and just produce and you know and and clock out and you know and it's like you don't want to you don't want to be managing things, your people, this that you know whatever. You just want you just want your space to do what you do and do it excellently. And then uh, and when you become good. I hear this all the time, not just with artists, but just in general. Um, they then want you to take on a, a leadership role in the company, which then ultimately pulls you off of what you're doing great. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and it and it's <clears throat> it, it 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 happens in every industry. And uh, you know, my father runs a uh, real estate brokerage, and happens in real estate, you get top salesperson, then you're like, yeah, they can teach other people how to sell and manage it. And, you know, and, but then you're pulling your top salespeople off of what they do really, really well. And, and so they can go be a manager, which they're right. not. <laughs> right. So, um, so it makes sense that you're, you're, you're still getting to create doing design work and then also your paintings as well. And you're, um, in a good place because you're creating, you're, you're doing the work. Yeah. Yeah. And it's important. Does, um, when running your business, do, do, do you run it solely or does your wife help you with an aspect of it? No, it's just me. Just you? Yeah. That works. Um, <laughs> yeah. So far. Uh, I don't always know what I'm doing, you know, half the time, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's part of it, right? That's life, right? <laughs> just trying to figure it out. Yeah, you know, as you go. Um, that's cool, man. That's cool. Yeah. So, uh, so you went to Pratt, you got out, you started working in design. When, right. when, when did you move back to Baltimore then? Well, I moved back right out, right out of school. I, oh, they, okay. The, the design firm was in um, Baltimore and Towson and, uh, um, so I, I came right back here and and now I live pretty much the same town where I grew up, which is weird. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's nice. Um that's really cool, man. I like that. Uh so I wanted to take a look at the, uh, a couple of your images real quick. Um I was looking under your figurative work and there were a couple of them that really stuck out to me, right? They just like jumped out and, and, and I had to go back and look at them. I'm like, why, why in the world are, are, are they like speaking to me so much? Okay. And then I figured out why, because they all have a similar pattern to them. Um, and uh, it's it's the alone at monks one. Okay. Uh, be strong. Yeah. Uh, and of good, uh, I guess courage is probably what it is. Um, yeah. And then the hidden kiss, which is interesting. I like that one a lot. And then uh, alone with friends. So it's kind of weird. They're all in that same area. But what I realized that they all have in common is that behind the heads or above the heads of the people. Mm -hmm. It's this ornate architecture, this rhythmic pattern that tends to actually flow and 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 support and encourage the subject of the story, which is the person and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, the alone at monks is interesting because you have this guy in this very um, silent moment, and yet 
the curves and the cool to warm temperatures of the neon light behind him, even though I don't think it's on because it's during the daytime. It might be on. Um, I like that because it, it shows that even though he looks still and in a quiet moment, his mind is extremely active. Mm. And the way we we feel that is because our eyes are picking up on all of that curvature in the sign, but we're looking at him. And so it, it, it kind of merges inside of us. And so we, we see him being still, but we feel him thinking. And, uh, and then I realized that's the same thing with, with, with the four that really popped out at me. I, I, the one I fell in love with the, the first one was the, the woman um, wearing the scarf on her head. Mm-hmm. And then just the beautiful uh, rhythmic uh, folds that you have in, in her headscarf, but also are then reflected in the architecture behind her. Right. And, and just the, the merging of the two, it just, it just really, really hit me. I was like, Oh, wow. That's, that's nice. I like that a lot. Thanks, man. Where, where was that take? Oh, and I just clicked on it. So it was, uh, oftentimes when I look at images, I look at them small. I don't like enlarge them. <laughs> <laughs> so I just enlarged it and I just realized it's an old building. That's cool. Um, where, where was that taken? Um, that's this, um, Secret location near my house that I <laughs> secret in love with. <laughs> it's not the, the shoe it's house, is it? Really old, um, abandoned hospital complex. Oh, interesting! And, like it's a huge, huge campus. What and are they doing with it? A lot it? of the buildings have been sort of refurbished or you know mm. used now, but you know there's all the lead paint and asbestos and. <laughs> It costs it costs more to fix an old building than to build a new building. So yeah. there's these tons of these buildings back there that are just, you know, decaying. Mm. And beautiful. I mean, the architecture is incredible back there. You know, they were built a hundred years ago or over that. I mean, back when people like really cared mm-hmm. About their craft, and each building's different. You know, they're not like cookie cutters. They've got all these little touches and yep. ornate details that I just think are so beautiful. Um, so yeah, I I like to go back there, and I've I've done a I've done a few paintings back in that area. Hmm. I like I like it because when I'm looking at it, especially how the the architecture in the windows are crisscrossing each other, right? And so your eye moves maybe from the left to the right, but then it comes back and goes from the right to the left and it, it just keeps going back and forth. Mm-hmm. Um, but then as it's, as you're going through this back and forth m- moment, you're also descending into her, which then kind of has, again, this back and forth movement with this, uh, these, this arabesque running through her, 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 uh, shawl. I don't know what I'm, I don't know what people call it. Um, I want to call it a hijab, but I <laughs> know that's not what it is. Um, uh, it probably is. Depends on the culture, I guess. But yeah, it's a scarf, headscarf, shawl, headscarf. whatever. <laughs> and what's cool is because of all the verticals in it, she, st- you know, there's a moment of uh, of um, certainty and con- um, strength in her. That's right. the word, strength. But with all of these beautiful. Um, curves moving back and forth back and forth you feel like she's in this moment of she's trying to make maybe a really important decision right and she's calculating and thinking um before acting and that's yeah. it's complex for sure yes very 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 so i, I like that a lot it's, it's, who, who's the model i'm thinking that mm-hmm. I'm sorry, what was that i was gonna say who's the model oh that's my wife i thought so yeah <laughs> i've painted her a few times so the four, the four that you actually mentioned, I'm looking at them, and they're all ones that I've put a subject pretty much dead in the middle, which is mm-hmm. generally not what you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I sort of break that rule a lot. <laughs> um, but yeah, you said a lot of smart things. I'm going to steal some of that. 
go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I like them a lot, man. It's, uh, I do like the Kiss one. They were kind of, um, I'm assuming that's in uh, Italy, Italy that's as well. Bad, obviously, yeah. Okay, okay. Because when I first looked at them, I was like, man, there's so many places like that in Portugal. The only difference is that in Portugal, they don't have the ground like that. Um, mm-hmm. Just like like um, slabs of, of brick right. like that. They have this, it's almost like a cobblestone, but it's flat tile. So right. it's almost like the roads are mosaics. And literally they have these beautiful, gorgeous designs mm-hmm. of black and white um, just flowing through the streets. It's, 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 it's pretty incredible and not only on the streets but a lot of the buildings have this gorgeous tile work so it's like it's like they found tile and then they just put it everywhere and um i guess long long ago there was must have been like a a donald trump kind of character who fell in love with tile rather than gold and brass (laughs) and just (laughs) put it on every building every street (laughs) yeah that sounds beautiful i mean i'd love to go to portugal someday you should, man. It's a great place. It, the what food's incredible. Hmm? What took you there? A plane. No. Um, <laughs> a combination of things between a dream that I had 15 years ago and I decided that I wasn't going to wait another 15 years. I was just going to go and do it. Um, a girl. Uh, art. So it's just a combination of a bunch of stuff. And um, it was time. And so I went and Went for five months and uh, it was it was cool. It was cool. And this was I had this dream years and years ago that I would die in in Spain or Portugal area of the world. And so I was like, "All right, I got to I got to go." And when I got there, I was like, "Yeah, I'd like to die here one day." <laughs> and it was a very weird, you know, thing to say. But um, I met this one guy there and, and I made the comment. He's like, I totally know what you mean. And he was from Brazil. And and he's like, oh, I was just saying that to my wife. Like, this is where I want my last place to be, you know, huh. my last breath to be. Um, but yeah, the, the but then I, I wasn't sure if it was going to be Spain or Portugal. And then I saw a video. I always thought it was going to be Spain. Then I saw a video about a year before I went about nine months before I went and I just saw the tile work and I was like, Whoa, this place is just literally like encrusted in design. Hmm. And, um, and so I, I was like, okay, that's it. That's where I'm going. <laughs> and uh, yeah. So it's, it was, it was a cool experience. And then you get there and it's like, everything's like super, super cheap, like insanely yeah. cheap. And so, um, yeah, you know, so my goal is to go there once a year and begin to have that little pattern. So <clears throat> I was supposed to be there actually today is my one of my dear friend's weddings. Uh, and um, but I'll probably end up going in the summer. Uh, but anyways, but if you could ever make it, it's it's becoming like an art hub. And I was so surprised at the amount of talent. Really? Uh, yeah. And I think it, it's probably because of the tile work and just being around mm-hmm. this, this design everywhere that a lot of the illustrators and artists had this, um, the sensitivity to design in their artwork that I don't really, I, that I really haven't seen in, um, in the States. And so it was a very, it was, was, I I was just constantly surprised at it. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Um, So do you plan on going back to uh, Italy soon? I don't have any plans, but I'm sure I will. (laughs) I'm sure I'll go back there. What what place would you like to go to that you haven't gone to yet? Um, I haven't spent much time in Northern Italy. So mm. I'd like to do that. The, the mountains and lakes up there would are, are beautiful from what I've seen. Um, but even the places that I've been to, you know, the, the major, 
the major cities, there's you, you can spend a lot of time there and still not experience all of it. So, um, but, they, um, but Fabriano, where is where that one painting was from? Um, they they make watercolor paper there. The, ah, nice. Okay, um, it's kind of their um, their their industry has been there for a long time. And your medium is watercolor. Yes. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's insane. The, the I, I can't even, I don't even understand how people do that. <laughs> like, <laughs> that must be some insane amounts of patience you got, man. Yeah, I mean, it, it takes a long time for sure. Um, it's just a, it's a little bit different way of, of thinking and approaching painting too. Mm-hmm. I seem I sort of fell into and and liked. Um, I used to. I mean, I painted with oil in in college, and then I I kind of moved into acrylic for a long time. Mm. But I found myself watering down the acrylic more and more, and, and just glazing a lot. And so when I tried watercolor, I really just fell in love with that and, and the properties that it has. It's just it's completely different, and. Uh, I don't know. I just took to it really well. People, no. I, a lot of people don't understand, or like non-artists especially. I try to. It's kind of hard to explain. Uh, I mean, oil painting be is opaque, right? And mm-hmm. watercolor, I paint transparent, transparent watercolor, and it's they're just opposite ways of approaching painting. Because with oil paint, you can, you can, you can do an underpainting. Mm-hmm. And then you've got your your white paint and your all your value scale. You can go back and forth, you yep. know, paint white over something or scrub it out. Or, and with watercolor, you can't. the The white is the is the white <clears throat> of the paper mm-hmm. shining through. So you have to hold on to that. There's no there's no going back if you. I mean, generally speaking, you yeah. Color, you're not. So it's kind of like so. This, the way I I came up with it, trying to explain it to people that aren't artists is that. It's kind of like sculpting that if you're a, an oil painter, it's like a sculptor who sculpts with clay. Mm-hmm. And if you, uh, you know, if you make the head too small, you just get some more clay, you add it on there and you're, you're good to go. But watercolor is like a sculptor who's sculpting in marble. If you chisel away that head and make it too small, you're kind of screwed. <laughs> you can't glue that marble back on. And so it's like if you screw up your whites on your paper, you're not really getting back to it. Back to them, so yeah, kind of approach the whole thing differently. I, you have to think, how am I gonna build this up the way I want it to go? And and do you create like a little plan, um, or, or something, or or because yeah, it's, there's it's, a lot to hold in your head to because your your work is very complex. It's not like you know simple little washes. I mean, it's 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 really complex. Yeah, and I I do a lot of painting in my head. Um, and my wife, you know, she would think I was crazy and because I'm just like staring <laughs> at a, at a piece of paper, but it, yeah, I just got to figure out and sort of do the steps in my head on how I'm going to, I'm going to tackle it. So do you enjoy doing the, um, figurative work or, or the still lives? Um, I, I love people. Mm-hmm. I love painting people. Um, I'm an introvert, so I'm not like, I need to be around people all the time. <laughs> I, love, uh, I love watching people and painting people. Um, and I just think that that's what I'm drawn to most is just the, um, the, the beauty that's there. And I think everybody's got, got something that, you know, is beautiful and fascinating about them. And to try and capture that is, is fun. Um, but I also do... Um, I see the still life stuff because I, you know, just to I take a break or spice it up, I want to do other things and practice, you know, different techniques or different <clears throat> different textures in a still life. I think, um, I mean, when you look at the still lives and you look at the figure, <clears throat> it's almost like two different artists are working on it. Give me one second. Had to clear my throat. It's it's almost yeah, like there's two different artists working on it. Like how, how 
it's hard because like I'm trying to like establish a certain look or a certain style and but some people like the one and other people like the other so I kind of go back and forth how would you describe the difference um well I mean my my still lives are really influenced by the old you know Dutch masters um you know dark dark background strong light light source mm -hmm. uh, I just I'm drawn to that that contrast um and it just it sort of became like an exercise or study and like well I don't know how in the world I would paint you know, fill in the blank whatever it is but you know just dive in and try it and see if I can do it because there's always, there's always something that's like, like, I'm not sure how I'm going to pull this off. <laughs> In almost every painting, there's there's usually some little element or some texture or, you know, I was like, I don't know about this. And then, you know, you just got to like dive in and try it. And so I try a lot of, a lot of different things in, in the still life work hmm. that I don't actually get a chance to do in the figurative work. Yeah, I see um, in your still life work, uh, you have far more control because you're controlling the the um, the setup, right? Right. And there's just, and I, I see in the, your graph, I, I don't know if it was graphic design that you were doing, I'm assuming it was, um, but, I, but I do see that you're thinking, you're composing at a far different level yeah it takes people don't realize how long it takes to to put one of those together just the just gathering all the pieces that i want to do and then arranging them and making the composition you know i can be like 80 hours in i mean not mm. eight, uh eight eight hours just like getting stuff and then another eight hours composing it before i even start painting so yeah it's definitely a a lot of work that goes into that up front. Yeah. Which I think you're seeing. Um, okay. Yeah, that, he painted that little statue uh, a couple of times. Um, I was like, yeah, are my eyes fun. messing up? <laughs> and uh, like the, the, the fish too. It's when I, because of that very reason, I put so much time into getting all the, all the props, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it together. Mm -hmm. I need to maximize this and try to get as many paintings out of as I can. <laughs> oh no, that's wise, man. That's, that's wise. Um, that's cool, man. The only problem with your with your with your still lives is you're making me really, really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like oysters, fish, I know. oranges. Oh god, yes. I tell you, like when I was doing these oysters, <clears> I was long. Oysters, but I was like, there's no way I was touching those after they've been sitting out that long. <laughs> uh yeah i i really i really enjoy the still life man uh the the movement the design uh the juxtapositions that are in there um what that tells me is your hmm. let me ask you this question which sells quicker your still lives or your figurative work? Mm, yeah, people have asked me that before. It's actually, uh, man, it's hard to say. Still life might edge out a little bit, mm -hmm. but it's it's almost equal, surprisingly. Yeah. If I was a puppet master and I could have you do something, I would love for you to figure out a way to merge the two, where you are able to do figurative work like you do, but have far more control over the image hmm. right um i think the combination of the two would 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 unlock a version of yourself that um uh people would would totally love i i love the fact that you put your name on the book <laughs> that's awesome yeah i like to sneak it in there sometimes <laughs> I was like, what book is that? Bird. Oh man, this must be a family app. Oh, it's Matthew Bird. <laughs> That's cool. Um, yeah, there's just so much more control because you're you're literally like in a weird way, the god of this of this 
world and you're setting everything in order. Um, right. And that that's an incredible thing. So, you know, you're, you're good at it. You're really good at it. Oh, thank you. And, uh, that's an interesting idea. I'll have to think about that. And I think that's probably a little bit of like the, the, the paintings that stuck out um, because you did put the figures in the center, but they're also very muted images in the sense that um, uh, the, the four that I pointed out, mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's controlled. There's not a lot of external um, chaos that you have to manage you've kind of eliminated those things mm. um, and replaced them with this by catching the, the rhythms of these designs that are behind the people um, and then merging the figure into those. <clears throat> um, yeah. You might've put them in the center, but um, it also works that they're in the center because they're the, at least three of the four that I pointed out are portrait orientation. And so okay. in all four of them, having that vertical alignment and thrust works really nice, but, but then you break it up with these diagonals and these curves. So it's more like diagonals with the dog and the man, but, um, uh, and even diagonals in the feet of, uh, in, in the lower part of the people who are kissing. Um, but then you have these beautiful curves going through the umbrellas. You have these beautiful, gorgeous curves going through, um, it kind of sounds weird. Uh, you have beautiful curves going through your wife, um, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> and then the guy sitting in in the, in the bar again. Um, these beautiful curves. So it's this beautiful juxtaposition mm -hmm. um, that's really really working nicely, and 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 uh, and I see that you do it even in your still lives. Um, you know, again, like in almost all, almost all of them, there's this beautiful arabesque that's flowing through them. Um, that's pulling it all together and, and just giving a really nice, elegant design to it. Um, Thanks, man. Maybe something fun to, to experiment with. Yeah. Um, so, Matt, five, ten years from now, ideally, you could wave a little magic wand as an artist, what would your life be looking like? Um, well, based on what you were just saying, who knows what I'll be painting. Uh, <laughs> I, I would think that, I guess, I would hope that uh, my, my career path would continue on and uh, be you know, selling more and um, maybe teaching. Uh, mm. I'm just starting to get into that this year. Um, so we'll see where that goes. Um, maybe, uh, maybe be in a good gallery. Um, still kind of on the fence on, with the gallery thing, but, I've but been, what, what's your hesitation with the gallery? Um, I think it just seems like the, a lot of stuff's changing really fast right now mm -hmm. and with social media and, uh, you know, I've, I've been able to sell paintings on my own. Uh, and a lot of galleries I haven't been super impressed with, mm -hmm. but it's obvious you have to find the right gallery for your work. Um, and I've been working, with uh, a gallery in Charleston, um, Robert Lang, mm. they're super awesome. Um, and I, I, they, they represent uh, a lot of uh, fantastic talent, um, representational art, and uh, it's been a really, really positive experience. So um, who knows, uh, five years, you know, maybe I'll, I'll have a little more exposure in other parts of the country, that, which would be nice. Nice. Yeah, you know, I, I feel you on that, man. It's it's uh, it's a dilemma because you've been drilled in, oh, gallery, gallery, gallery. That's the way the artist makes their Mallory. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and yet you're living in this time where those gatekeepers in almost all industries 
are becoming more irrelevant, but there's still this beat exactly. that this drum beat that's been put in your head and it's this fight. Exactly. And there's <clears throat> they're great. There's really great galleries out there that of course I'm just not good enough to be <laughs> yet. But you know, it's like yeah. the, it's like being a, a, a writer or a publisher. Um, and I've seen this happen many times where in the past you, you need to go to the gatekeeper, you know, Oh, am I worthy? No, you're not, you know? And so you wouldn't be published. Well, nowadays you have all these vehicles through blogs and podcasts and self publishing and Amazon. And it, well, you can just go direct to consumer, right? Yeah. And, and, and do it and put it out there. And if you're able to, uh, if, you, if the market embraces you and what you're putting out there, well, then those big guys will come to you. And, and so I, I, I think that artists needs to, and this is why I asked about the agency question in the, in the conversations, because they need to realize they're far more in control than, than they're being told. And, at some point they'll, they'll get it. You know, I mean, a lot of times artists will put their art on, on these websites and say, Oh, I put it on this website and I put it on that website. And then they, then they get the solution because they ain't selling anything. Right. Um, yeah. And, and then they'll say, well, it's not working. Well, it's not working because how much money did you put into marketing it, you know, and yeah. actually driving traffic to, to yeah. your work. <laughs> yeah. You know, so you're, right. you're definitely right that there's a, there's a lot going on with technology now that's circumventing the status quo. Yep. Um, which in, I, I think in some ways is a really good thing. Um, I think there's a lot going on in the upper echelons of the, of the art world that's just like insane and I don't understand at all. Sure. But um, I think that's a, that's, that's a place where if we're not careful, you can spend a lot of tr time worrying and, and, and stressing about and it has, it's irrelevant to us. Well, yeah, it's it's irrelevant to ninety nine percent of the people. Yeah, but I'm, I, you're totally right that that a lot of that's that's getting broken down and, and cracked up because people don't need the those gatekeepers as much anymore to see art that is engaging to them and that's meaningful to them. I think a lot of people in the past kind of get turned off when they, they feel like they don't understand art or they feel, you know, talked down to because, you know, they're looking at a painting and they have no idea what they're looking at and they need a, there's a, there's a plaque that's telling them what the painting says, which to me is, you know, it's a sign of a problem or a failure mm -hmm. on the part of the painting if you need to have the crutch of another medium to explain what your original medium is saying. <laughs> you know, and yeah, I, a lot of people off. Whereas now you can um, find find art that speaks to them or that that resonates with them and might uh, embolden them on their their journey into the arts. Yep, where they can grow and appreciate more and more. Hopefully over the next 10 years, um, more people will learn the finesse, the, the power that's available to them. Um, what do you mean by that? There's tons of power right now available, you know, but the, the truth is, is a lot of artists, um, well, they're not business people, so they don't think like business people. Right. You know, they're, they're, they just want to produce their work and they don't do the time. They don't take the time to study and practice and fail and fail and fail and fail. Yeah. And there's a whole art and science to selling. Mm -hmm. And we have all of these tools available to us. Um, also, I think um, <clears throat> there's a lot of lying that goes on in all parts of life but specifically talking about artists and i think there's a lot of um lying to oneself 
you know, that they think, well, just because I made an image, people should buy it. It's like, no, they shouldn't. <laughs> just because yeah. you made it that doesn't mean you're entitled to somebody else's money, right? Like, you've got to earn it. You have to know, um, <clears throat> you know, you, you have to build a quality product. You have to put it into a market. You have to find the market that wants that work. And that That's a work in itself. And years ago, the galleries would do that if you found the right galleries. But, you know, over the last several decades, gal- many, not all, but many galleries have just turned into places where, you know, you pay to be in there and, you know, you put up a show and there's very little money that goes into marketing it. And, you know, and, and it's really, you bring your, your friends and your family to that gallery and, you know, um, and it's kind of all on the artist. And then, then you're supposed to hand over 50% of what you sell right. uh, to the people that you could have sold and made a hundred percent because you probably knew them. You know? <laughs> so um, now that that's one level of galleries. There's a whole another level of galleries that, you know, are, are in that legitimate business of promoting the artists and stuff, but right. they're a lot fewer than they used to be. But um, if you find those, you know, that that's where you want to be. You know, so I'll, I'll throw this out to people. Um, right now on Instagram, that's where if you want to, if you have a product that's let's say a thousand dollars or less, maybe fifteen hundred dollars or less, Instagram is a great place to sell. So now people will take pictures and they'll put it all up on Instagram, but there it's like okay, well that you're promoting it, but you haven't led anyone through the selling process to actually buy it and and there's an art in that and so now they actually have tools that you can connect to your instagram either through facebook or or third-party tools where people can look at the image tap on it and then buy it you know so that's that's starting to come out in, in the last several months um which is opening up a whole world of possibilities yeah. um you know so this is somewhere along the lines, like either a company needs to be set up that will go and sell for artists, like almost like a rep, an online rep, or Mm -hmm. artists are going to have to learn that, you know, every Thursday and Friday, they're not painting, they're marketing and selling, you know, or whatever, like they're going to have to set up. Yeah. You know, it's hard though. Cause the other, on the other hand, and this is why I said before I'm on the fence about the whole thing because like there is nothing like seeing art in person and seeing it on a little three inch screen. I mean, everything looks good when it's small, but it's hard to know. I mean, I've seen stuff on my phone and then seen it in real life and like, eh, is isn't quite as good as I thought it was, <laughs> you know, uh, yep. so seeing something in a gallery, there's, there's really, there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, it's, it's a tricky thing for sure. Well, then you have to build for that experience. Yeah. You know, you have to make sure that when I'm training my students, I call it the macro, which is that you've walked in the, the room, the gallery or a room, and you see the painting across the room. Like you, it needs to be designed to win at that level. Mm. And then the mac the micro is that sec is actually the conversation the person has with the piece. So I always say it's like, you know, walking in a bar and seeing a beautiful woman across the room and you're like, Ooh, and you walk up to her and then you, you know, like, Hey, what's your name? And she's like, she just blinks at you. Cause she, she has nothing to say, you know, <laughs> like um, there's no substance there. It's all beauty, no brain. Right. And so a lot of artwork, I see that way. It's a lot of, quote unquote beauty it's pretty but when you really get close and you look and you start asking some Uh great questions all of a sudden it just falls apart and it's very flaky and sadly people do that subconsciously they're not conscious of it but on a subconscious level they can tell if the quality is there or not and um so as, as the as the artist i think it's our responsibility to make sure that the quality is on that first experience and also on that second, when that second will be second, third, hundredth, 300th experience, it's still quality. 
Right. And um, uh, what makes you want to go back and look at it again? Yeah. Or, or, yeah. or even maybe, <clears throat> yeah, look at it. I, I, I like to say <clears throat> experience it. Experience it. Sure. You know, um, but yeah, because it, it's strange. Like one, one of the first things I, I, I drill into my students is this idea that you're not actually building a painting for people to consciously look at like because the reality is though they will spend time in front of it like with the painting in front of their face the majority of the time the painting will just be in their space right so so you design it to work on a peripheral Hmm. uh level which is really a subconscious level and and, and, and then you, you, of course, you have to make it work on a conscious level, which is when they're actually looking at it. But if 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 it's not designed right, it doesn't work on that subconscious level. It actually it it doesn't attract it. It like repels people, like pushes people away. And then people don't have the the awareness to be able to articulate why the image is not working for them. They just feel off. They they don't feel at peace. They don't feel right, and more times than not, they'll blame it on themselves. Because you know, I don't know why. I just for some reason, I like it, but I won't buy it. Hmm. You know, and it's it, and so it's like knowing knowing really how we engage with a work of art, and when you know that, then you can actually design and plan and and execute a great work of art in your style, your medium, your context but in a way that actually cares and takes care of the, uh, of the viewer. And, and you worked in advertising. It's called user experience. What's, yep. what's the user experience? And that's where we start from, uh, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, man, you got a whole bunch of wonderful things going on in your work. Um, I, I'm actually really enjoying your still life, just like up on my screen, just as my eye flows through it. There's just so many wonderful things that are happening that um, my little Jiminy Cricket is smiling. Well, that's good. <laughs> Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> um, I won't read into that. What was that? I'll try not to read into that too much. <laughs> yeah, that was not. <laughs> I think it was too much Jordan Peterson talking about Pinocchio. Um, so, uh, so let me ask you, like, if you were talking to – another artist mm-hmm. what advice what's what's one type of advice that you would uh, encourage them in or give them um well let, 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 me, let me narrow it down if you're going to do tackle watercolor because you got some some serious skill in it man um if if an artist wanted to get into watercolor, what how would you encourage them, or what would you tell them to to do or not do? Um, well, the real trick to being good at watercolor is you don't use water; you use um, the tears from kittens. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were serious for a second until you said kittens. But um, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's hilarious. I don't know that it's that it's it's different <laughs> than any anything else i mean there's the there's the technical aspects of watercolor and and mastering that craft which would be different than in other mediums but i think broadly it's it's no different than anything else and a lot of the you know advice that i don't want to say cliche advice but the it's the right advice is you know just master your craft Mm. um work hard uh and what does that look people, like people, from, from your perspective? It means showing up every day. Mm-hmm. Um, some people think that artists just sit around so they're inspired. And that's nonsense from my perspective because that doesn't always happen. And I don't have time to wait for it to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, even if you're not, you're not creating a masterpiece every day, but if you want to go pro as a painter, you got to show up at the easel and, and work whether you want to or not and you know you're building your skills you're mastering your craft regardless of whether you're feeling 
inspiration, but it's a, you know, it's a job like any other job. Sometimes you don't want to do it, but you still gotta, you know, persevere. So, I mean, I think that's a, that's a basic thing. I think most people would agree with. I don't, I forget what that, that it's like 10,000 hours or something to yeah. get really good at something. Um, and I would also say, uh, you learn, learn how to lose. Mm. Um, I mean, one definition of a winner is someone who never stops, lets losing stop them. Mm. And I think that's really important, especially for artists. It's important to, to put your work out there and, uh, and be able to handle the rejection and harsh critique. Um, get work and submit to competitions. And, you know, if you don't, if you don't win, that's all right. Learn from, you know, the other, other things that, that you see, what other people are doing that are better than you. And, uh, you know, maybe, you know, set, I like to aim high. I think that's important, but you got to manage your expectations too. Mm-hmm. And, uh, manage, you got to challenge yourself. So if you're, if you are competing and you're, you're, you know, winning every single time you're getting, you know, the top prize, maybe, maybe you're not in the right area of competition. You need to like take it to the next level. You know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you got 50 ribbons from the County fair. That doesn't make you great. You know, maybe go to the state fair and see how you do that kind of thing. You know, you can be a, a big fish in a little pond or a little fish in the big pond. That's that's brilliant, man. That's awesome. Do, do you have any um, rituals that you go through besides, you know, extracting tears from kittens um, <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that you do when, when you have to persevere, when, when your mind is saying, oh, but your heart is like, has to, has to step up and, and push through. Is there anything that you do personally that just certain music that you listen to? Is there certain food that you might end up eating? Um, yeah, I mean, I, music's a, a big, a big thing for me. I, it, uh, sort of clears my head or calms my mind sometimes depending mm. on what I'm listening to. Um, and that that sometimes helps, you know, just sort of meditate. What do you like? And uh, what do you like listening to? Well, it depends on what I'm doing, what kind of mood I'm in. Um, a lot of times, if I'm just trying to to calm and and block things out and 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 focus or meditate, you know, I'll, I'll just put on uh, something that doesn't have uh, words necessarily. So I'll, I'll listen to a lot of classical or um sort of ambient type stuff mm. nice i like uh or even like i, I like cigarettes a lot and they there's words but i don't know what they are because they're from iceland and i don't know what they're saying but the music's cool <laughs> what, what's the name of the band uh cigarettes cigarettes yeah interesting and they actually made up their own language i don't even know what it's but it sounds it sounds beautiful and I like it. So <laughs> that's awesome. I'm gonna check it out. That's Cigarettes. a weird that's a whole other weird thing, right? I mean, if I don't they I don't know what they're saying, but it sounds <clears throat> it sounds good. I, I I love that, man. About that. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> uh a lot of times you know, it's it's interesting. What one one of the keys I, I was listening to this neuroscientist talk about creativity. And she was saying that um, one of the things, the reasons why a lot of times when you're taking a shower or doing dishes or doing, you know, maybe out for a jog or a walk, um, mm-hmm. you, you just start getting flooded with all of these ideas, right? To the point that sometimes you have to like, stop, you know, like turn them off. And she was saying, well, what happens is when you, when you put your body into a repetitive motion, um, which doesn't require much thought. It's a very simple little action like walking or running or, you know, 
a lot of times when you take a shower, it's kind of rote. You to kind of know you go through a, a mm-hmm. system, sure. but and it, therefore it, it requires very your your brain is engaged, your body's engaged, but it's at a very very low frequency, <clears throat> and it then allows all of these connections to occur. And that's really what creativity is, is just connecting two or more things together. Um, you know, like, oh, that's what that means because of this, that, you know, that, that. Mm-hmm. and so um, music without uh, music that you can't understand in the sense that you don't know what the lyrics are can do that because you're not focused on the left brain language aspect of, of that's required. So it's yeah. much more of this feeling and you're just being in tune with the vibration of the sound, which then puts you in a whole different state. That's why a lot of like these monks will chant, you know, om, om, right. Mm-hmm. It's like, they're just putting out a vibration that then they become in tune with. And some people take it, you know, into a whole metaphysical science of it, different vibrations will do different things in your body. Um, <clears throat> I, I did this one exercise once, which was very fascinating. I encourage anyone to do it, but just say your name really slow, um, speak it out and feel the vibration of the sound of your own name, like really just focusing on it. It's, it's, mm. or whatever word like even just the word love right versus hate right <laughs> like like just just to feel the vibration of what that feels like and if you do it slow and intensely and very deliberately you you literally feel it in your mouth and in your body it's it's a it's an incredible little exercise um so i i totally dig the whole uh you know, listening to music that you don't understand. Um, <clears throat> secretly, when I was younger, I used to always have this fantasy of making love to a woman who didn't speak English. Sorry, why I went to Portugal. Um, <laughs> because the idea of her expressing herself and communicating in a language that I didn't know, but I had to know what she was communicating, it was it's always been fascinating to me. Like, what was the true expression, not what the brain conceived, you know, but to know <clears throat> uh, that, that, that experience in its raw, real moment, not this conscious, uh, that sounds weird, but this uh, overly rationalized experience that then comes out through a language. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and it, and so uh, that's kind of one of the things I love about representational art is that it is a universal language that you know it doesn't matter what uh, what language you speak if you can see see a painting and there's it communicates to you regardless of um, you know what what country you're in or whatever yeah good I guess I can see that because you're you're seeing what you see right. Um, is it, though it would be interesting because depending on the culture, like if you capture, I remember I did a website once uh, for this financial company years ago, and they spend a lot of time in China. So I was like, oh yeah, you know, make it green and you know for money. <laughs> And then it came back, and they're like, no, you got to do this. Stuff. Like you got to make it red. I'm like red. And it's just because in China, red is just the, the color of prosperity and green is like a negative, right? So it was like, what? Hmm. And, um, you know, like even like, if I'm correct, you wear white to a funeral, you know? So yet here we wear white to a wedding, right? You wear red, I, I think, at a wedding, a, a wedding a lot of times in uh, Asian cultures. Mm, that's interesting. So it is, yeah, and... I remember my brother, he went to Ecuador and uh, he would say, yeah, my dad is, is this high. He would say, you know, like, but he would put his hand horizontally. But in Ecuador, if you're talking about a person, you do it vertically. You would say that they're this high. And if you're talking about an animal, you would do it horizontally. So it just 
constantly confused them. Um, mm-hmm. And then they would laugh at him like, "What, well, your dad's an animal? Because he's... <laughs> and so... Uh, um, so I can see like where, where the representational is cool because people can see it. Um, but then there's also the challenge of what's inside that image that, um, you know, right. Yeah. I get what you're saying. You got a few little hangups here and there, but I, yeah. so what I'm talking about is the overall, uh, something that's really beautiful. You know, people go to the Sistine Chapel because it's magnificent. Mm-hmm. You know, of, you know, where you come from. It's just, there's something transcendent there, right? Yep. Yep. And that's where I'd always uh, push um, on is, is it's the, when I look at that kind of uh, experience, it, it's oftentimes through the design work, which mm. to me, I found design is that hidden language that we never made up but it exists. It's, it's laws that exist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and, or it's like, um, like flirtation, right? There's a way that the body flirts and it doesn't matter what culture you in, you're in, women will tend to do certain things and men will turn, you know, men will tend to post their chest out and this, and it doesn't matter what culture you're in or what, what you're, you know, it's just the human instinct, right? It's it's the human patterns. And, uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, there's these, I always like trying to figure those things out through, through design so that no matter what the context of the picture is, um, people feel the same way, you know, they, Mm -hmm. they, they feel that experience. Yeah. So, uh, Matt, who are two or three people that you would like to, uh, give a shout out to that, that help you um be you man um help me be me <laughs> well my wife um how long have you guys been together uh coming up on 12 years holy moly man congratulations Thank you. that's awesome <laughs> that's awesome man uh, did, did you meet her in school or something or no i met her um it's it's actually weird because we we grew up going to the same church, but we never actually met, mm-hmm. so to speak. I, I mean, I'm a I'm a little bit older, but we actually met at a, uh, a swing dance. We were really yeah. Oh, that's so cool, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't you who I think you are? I like, yeah, yeah. Um, we won't tell Pastor we're here. No. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, my church is cool with that. Um, so yeah, my wife, she's, she's wonderful and, and a huge support for me and a great inspiration. Uh, and my kids too. Nice. Uh, I think a lot of my, my art really turned a corner with, you know, my family. And when I decided to start painting what I wanted to paint instead of what I thought other people wanted me to paint. And what is it that you want to paint? Um, well, just painting, uh, you know, I started painting portraits of, of my girls and uh, um, painting just whatever it is that I'm attracted to, whatever, <clears throat> whatever experience or, or joy is has crossed my path that, that, you know, inspires me. That's what I want to do as opposed to, um, you know, and being an illustrator and having to do what somebody else bring someone else's vision to life. Yep. Yep. Tell you, man. Um, and so you're, you're, uh, <clears throat> so w- what are you looking for when you're looking in your work? Like, I, I want to push you deeper on that. Like, what is it that you're looking for when you're looking? Um, I am. I'm looking for beauty. All right. And I think, um, you know, and I paint, so yeah, I'll paint my kids and yeah, it's pretty and it's sentimental and I get that. Mm -hmm. Not for everybody. Um, but I think more broadly what I'm trying to do is, is it's a search for beauty 
and I think there's beauty in you know everything. That's what I was saying in the beginning, you know. Um, and I think we're if it's people, you know, we're we're image bearers and um, image bearers. Wow, that's such a great way of putting it. And I just want to I want to be able to see that and and capture it so that other people can see what I see. You know, it's um yeah kind of looping back to what we were talking about before but just enabling especially people that aren't artists to see the world through an artist's eyes um that's that's what i'm trying to do trying to to, to find beauty and, and share it hmm. yeah, it's interesting as i just scroll scan through all your uh images here in your figurative work um I can tell you're a quiet guy <laughs> and um, <clears throat> and I like the idea that, you know, you take a complex thing like watercolor and you spend time painting in your mind, which I totally understand that, that concept. Um, <clears throat> and as I look through every single painting in here, even the people who are covered up by umbrellas, there's something that's very common in every single one of these images. Um, there's an aloneness, stillness, mm -hmm. but the activity that is the, the active part of each and every one of these paintings is the people's contemplation. Yeah, that's a big thing in my work. Um, that that inward moment inward reflection um, yeah i'm not i'm not sure why but i've always just been kind of drawn to that and um i do yeah i i'm glad you're seeing that because i certainly would think that that would be a repetitive repetitive thing well, to me I that's have something to do with like where i am when i'm when i'm painting it that that's what what I'm doing and then you know I go <clears throat> travel and I get I get jazzed up about hmm. jazz you know I see people playing music and I feel this you know different kind of energy and I try to capture that so nice I'm sure that has you know something to do with it too just where my head's you know what I'm experiencing at the time there uh, I, I when you talk about beauty oftentimes people will talk about beauty I'll call it pretty but oftentimes when, when people are thinking about beauty, they're thinking of an external thing. And for me, beauty is an internal thing. It's a consciousness that occurs. And you were saying that you're trying to, you know, capture this moment of beauty. And I think that you're, you're achieving it because this moment of beauty is, is this self, um, is this contemplation. It's this inner life that's alive. You know, mm -hmm. um, so I look at like, for example, an artist like Caravaggio and Bernini and both did these religious um, <clears throat> paintings and uh, sculptures. Right. Mm -hmm. But when studying their life, you realize that Bernini was actually a believer and Caravaggio wasn't. Right. And so, you know, that then uh came out in their work so for example bernini he would always use his wife as the model where caravaggio would always hire the prostitutes right mm -hmm. um and when it came to representing the presence of the divine caravaggio would use this external light source where bernini would almost make it look like it was an orgasm something that came from the inside and exploded out of the person's experience, right? Two very different consciousness because they had two very different perspectives and relationships with the divine. And, um, and for Caravaggio, it was always, you know, oh, the guy up in the clouds, you know, <laughs> and he was a brilliant designer and composer and communicator. But what he communicated was always this external thing. Hmm. And your work, though it's beautiful externally, 
uh, the magic is really making us feel this incredible internal life that's going on in inside the people. And that's really, and, and it's, it's very cool. It's, you know, it kind of reminds me of a Hopper painting, like mm-hmm. where there's this strange stillness and everything. Yeah. But, but this deep contemplation. And I think you actually do it better than Hopper, but, um, well, but there's, uh, and maybe just because well, I kind of yeah, like your style a little bit better. <laughs> I think there's a lot, a lot to what you're saying as far as just, um, you know, all of it, just be, and I find that I'm doing that when I'm working as well. You know, it's just it's mm. finding that stillness, um, and uh, you know, there's the the it almost become the work becomes a doxology in itself. Um, and if, as I'm doing it, as I'm creating it, and if I can kind of get that to come through, then I think there's that's successful. And I'm, I'm happy when that happens. Uh, the picture um, of the little girl in the trees. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming that's one of your daughters. She's my oldest, yep. Your oldest. Her eyes are so big and wide, um, taking in the world. But I'm looking at the trees, and I'm just kind of curious. It looks like the knots of the trees are eyeballs, too. Did you do that intentionally? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, that's cool. I don't know if you did that intentionally, but if you did, that's even awesome. <laughs> so what's the what's the story behind that? Oh, man. I She's um, – even when she was really little, she's just had this – quality about her that I've, I've wanted to paint it's I don't know even how to describe it she's not trying to be graceful or contemplative but she just is the other I mean the other one lost in thought is the same kind of thing where she was just wasn't posed really it's it's me trying to 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 capture and remember this uh, childhood innocence and um, this quality about her. Um, sometimes I just can't put my finger on it, but I, I'm drawn to it. I'm like, I gotta paint that. I know what you feel, man. My, my little daughter, she's my oldest, but uh, I have a, a son as well. Um, and her, her name is Sophia and I named her for the idea of wisdom mm. and uh she 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 would do that like she people would complain <laughs> she would scare grown men because she'd just look at them in the eyes and just <laughs> like you could tell she was observing and analyzing and reading and like all this activity was going on in this little tiny at a deep level yeah. at a deep level yeah <clears throat> and um uh i took a picture of her when she was i don't know maybe two and I was like, oh, my God, she looks like Ayn Rand, right? Like, <laughs> like, it, like, there was just immense amounts of calculation. Like, she would take her little stool and go out to the front porch. And, and she was only, like, maybe not even two at the time, too. And she literally just sit there. And we would just watch her, right? We wouldn't tell her, to, to, you know, come in the house. You know, like, she'd just go out there. And we would watch her. And she'd be out there literally for, like, two hours just like watching people cars things like she was just content just soaking in and processing all of this information it was that's great and i love that it's like i encourage it it's like but yeah who knows what's going on in there they're 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 learning and developing you know they're in their own way in that and it's better than sitting in front of the TV or something. <laughs> That's awesome, man. I love it. I love that. I love that you caught it. Um, <clears throat> beautiful, beautiful, Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Um, so before we, uh, before I ask you how people can connect with you, I need to ask you one last, very, very, very significant question. Um, what do you like to eat? Hmm. 
Um, I'm a carnivore. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I love seafood. Nice. Um, being in Maryland, I I love I love crabs. I love I love any kind of seafood. Um, you like those soft shell crabs? I do. Yeah, those. You know, once or twice a year, I'll do that. Nice. I, I had my first one in Portugal. It was the creepiest thing, and I'm like, are you supposed to eat? Like, how do you take yeah. the? They're like, no, you just eat it. Head around it. It's yeah, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just ate a crab, man. Shell and everything. <laughs> um. So yeah, and then you know we we steam them here too. We have big crab feasts. And oh wow. Um, that's fun, not just for the food, but that's just an experience, you know, just getting everybody around the table and just the fellowship and, and the friends that are there. It's, it's a, you know, hours you sit there and just talk and the crabs and it's, that's a lot of fun. So, right. yeah. and, uh, uh, I don't know. I, I love, I love sandwiches. Anything, uh, anything between bread. Uh, that's my jam. So, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story about sandwiches. Um, I knew my marriage was over <laughs> when my daughter and I were looking on the computer and we're like, yeah, this will be like, we were envisioning a studio. This was before my, my first son came. And so it was actually a couple of years before the marriage was over. But it was at this moment that... It was one of those one of those moments that was like, I'm not sure this is good. So my daughter and I are looking, we're dreaming about this great big studio that one day we'll have together, right? And uh, my wife comes in and my daughter says, Mom, like, look at dad and I are looking at our, our future studio and, and, and you can bring us sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, uh, there's something in there that's just, that's just not right. <laughs> you can bring us sandwiches uh yeah so you got, you got a great way of telling stories you, you start something out and i'm like what where is he gonna say i gotta hear what they stick around for this what is this oh thank you so but she did make great sandwiches actually uh when my son was born she ended up having a gallstone um pass and she was making these <laughs> this incredible sandwich that she made and uh and and most of me i'm gonna be honest most of me was like we gotta get her to the hospital but there was this other part of me like could we just could you just finish the sandwich first and then like we could (laughs) could you finish it while the ambulance is coming you know (laughs) she was she was an incredible cook man like uh she still is and now, luckily, my daughter's starting to learn it. So, but uh, out of all the sandwiches in the world, if you could have one sandwich right now, what would it be? Uh, Reuben. Oh, dude. He's, ah, that was a powerful answer. Nice. Nice. We can eat a Reuben and then we can look at Reuben's paintings. <laughs> Round out the experience. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you, let me ask you this question then on top of that like who what, what one or two artists do you love uh master artists that you 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 tend to kind of get lost in their work uh dead guys yeah um, dead guys <laughs> dead guys well i mean all the all the normal ones i guess uh that people spout off but I, one that's probably not um what you'd call a household name is um, Bouguereau and uh, also Bouvere, but I, Bouguereau especially, I remember when I first came across his work in New York, I was like, just speechless. I was like, stop. I'm like, what is this? And why have I never heard of this guy? And um, I went back to my apartment and I'm like, look, I got my Jansen history of art down. I'm like, looking for the Jansen. He's like not in there. You know, I go to the Pratt Library, which is an impressive library, and there's like there's stuff buried deep in the reference section that you can't check out. But I'm like, look at this guy. I'm like, how have I never heard about this guy? Um, and yeah, I just I can get lost in his work 
Is there? A, how would you spell his name? Uh, it's B O U G. Got his catalog somewhere. Um, e A U something. B O U G U E R E A U. Oh yeah, that's dude. I thought that's who you meant. Um, I yeah. Think- I think he has a you know it's interesting your work i can i can i can totally see your your uh he's definitely an influence yeah yeah um, i mean i can't capture <clears throat> the same quality that he does with with oil paints and and he just bring breathes life into into people and it's amazing um he so has a painting i think it's a little girl reading for some reason, it's, I'm thinking of a girl reading with um, a bird for yeah. some reason. Let me just see if I'm correct. Um, yeah, I think I might know what you're talking about. The guy was crazy prolific, too. I don't know how he painted so many paintings at that level of, you know, mastery, but yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on this, man. Um, yeah, there's a... Um, there's a website called the Art Renewal Center mm-hmm. um, that has like a huge, just huge online catalog of his work. And uh, the guy who runs that, his name's Fred Ross, uh, mm-hmm. had a very similar experience. I mean, probably a lot of people do when they first see Bugger, like, why haven't I heard of this guy kind of thing. And uh, he was uh, one of the guys behind sort of the resurgence and, and gathering all of that work out and, and cataloging it because it's not it's you know for for so long his work's been like in museums but it's like in the basement it's not on it's not on view which is just a shame so fred you're, you're talking about fred ross's work or no bugaro i'm okay fred ross, uh, you know just kind of led the charge in uh i got you in, uh, reviving awareness of, of bugaro i mean one of the guys that they have a big big influence and that website's a great place to go to see a lot of the work yeah yep there's a yeah it was when when i first met my 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 wife at the time and i started dating her she had a roommate who had a painting and it was a um bouvereau painting and uh it was like a print not a painting but like you know and it was this little girl reading and I just, it just floored me. And I was like, what the, and uh, so, yeah, it, huh. I want to analyze some of his paintings now. Very, very cool, man. Very cool. So um, how can people get connected with you? Um, I'm pretty easy to find and through my website and it's, um it's Matthew at MatthewBird.com. Um, I'm on Facebook, Instagram. Um, and I got to ask you this. I try to respond to, uh, you know, people that email me. And... You, 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 so you, you're okay with people emailing you, you said? Oh, sure. Awesome. As long awesome. as not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you like, you paid me and my, my family for, for $3? <laughs> You um, my <laughs> that's awesome um <clears throat> matt it was awesome talking with you man i i enjoyed your uh your chillness thanks don i really appreciate you reaching out this was fun it's uh it's a privilege to to be able to talk with you and share my work yeah, indeed. indeed uh well we'll stay in touch man you're 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 a cool cool cat for sure appreciate especially it. when you're you know, the tears are coming out of the kittens. Makes you even cool. <laughs> <laughs> In just 30 days, the Core 80 experience teaches you to decode the intentional design underneath great masterpieces. Through video lessons, assignments, and feedback, you learn to recognize the underlining structures like thrust maps, echoes, and gamuts that give master compositions substance and gravitas. Knowing how master artists and illustrators compose their artwork unlocks your ability to give your artwork more meaning and energy. Enroll today and get a seven-day, no-hassle, money-back guarantee at core80.com.